Uh, Weapon solutions, sorry about Thanks. that. Mm. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mark Stiles. Uh, I work at a company called Lear in Boston. And today I'm here to talk to you about something I feel very passionate about, which is machine learning. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where it came from, uh, where it is today. I'll show you some of the stuff that I'm doing with it. I'm going to try to hit you with some, some future stuff. and then. Uh, right now, what I'm going to do is just ask you a few questions, trying to get a, a feel for the audience. Uh, so first question, is there anybody here who's actually built anything with machine learning in the last year? I see a few hands, all right, great. Right. Uh, how, how many people have read an article in the last year about machine learning? All right. How many people think they know how it works? How many people actually know how it works? <laughs> Okay. Well, the good news is that you don't necessarily really need to know how it works at this point. What you really need to know is what to do with it. So machine learning and the idea of machine intelligence really comes from a man named Alan Turing. And he was an intelligence officer for the British. And what he was trying to do was crack the German Enigma encryption. Now, as long as humans have had hands, we've built computation devices. But what's significant about Turing and his point in time was that he was the first to really start to see a computer as more than just a computation device. For him, he started to realize that a machine was something that could potentially think. Now he writes this art, he writes his paper about this. And <laughs> I have a blog I've written a little bit. Uh, I can tell a snarky title when I see one. But, uh, and it's actually a very good read. It's only like four or five pages. But he, what, what happens is that he inspires so many people, mathematicians, scientists, authors. And what happens is, is people start to think about this concept of building a, a machine that can think. They have to ask themselves, how does my mind work? So they look to medical research. And at that time, this is about the 1950s, the, the latest research, they started, they discovered the neuron. And so these mathematicians, they get together and they start talking and they come up with this concept of a neural network. And later on, there's a man, Marvin Minsky, he co-founds the MIT Media Lab, and he writes this book. And it's filled with all these essays about how you would break down your thought process and make decisions and all these charts about how you would build workflows to do this. And I have this book, it's enormous. It's like this, you know, it's like trying to read a newspaper. Any of you who are here know what that is. <laughs> uh, he ends up co-authoring another book called Perceptrons, same topic. Uh, unfortunately, this has the distinction of chilling all this research because it leads people to doubt the feasibility of the technology itself. And research basically starts to dry up. It doesn't go away. It's still there. It's just that it, it really loses its legs. Now, this is around the 70s. And it doesn't really gain its resurgence until there's this availability of high-power computing, scalability, and an entirely new generation of people pushing advanced algorithms, which is today. And today, if you are like we are, marketers, uh, consumer marketing. There's a lot of things that we do and tools that we have that are very difficult to use. Uh, you can get a job done, you can do certain things, but they're limited in their skill. A-B testing, for example. This works at a level of 10, 20, 30 pages. But if you're talking about 10,000 pages, trying to A-B test every component on a page, this is not something you can keep up with. And if you're talking about analytics, again, it's the same idea. If you're looking at 100, 200 pages, you can kind of keep your head around like the flow and all the segments. But when you start to get half a million, million pages, you know, looking at this massive wall of you know, interactions, it can be kind of difficult. And same thing with if you're trying to do brand management or social media monitoring. You know, one of the challenges you're going to face is that you just you require so much vigilance. You kind of start to feel like you're part of a space launch. Now, a lot of people don't know this, 
but machine learning never really went away. Right? It was always there. It just really became this tool of companies that had the money to invest, to hire a team of scientists, to build out this monstrous set of computers with databases and memory. Uh, some of the companies and the, the organizations that were able to keep this going uh, were things like insurance companies. Right? If you're trying to insure a place or a number of places, you have to understand the risk. And if you have to take in this large body of weather data, uh, crunch that down and assign a risk so you can price it correctly. Government's the same way. If you have a large uh, military and you're trying to move them around the, the earth, you need to you know, make sure you're not putting them unnecessarily in the harm's way. Another kind of area where this is being actively used is banks and investment. High frequency trade lots. This is the stuff they're using. Just gives them that little bit of edge to get that investment and make that profit. Banks, in another way, an investment bank where you're lending money for real estate uh, investment, you want to be able to make sure that if you're going to give this person $100 million, that this property is going to improve its value. It's going to return you. So they're going to use these algorithms to understand large bodies of real, you know, uh, real estate data, make sure that that's something that's going to return for them. And really, right now, what's so interesting about the point that we're at is that the costs are starting to come down to a point where commercial marketing can afford it. And what's so great about this is that we can start to take advantage of it. Now, the reason that the costs are coming down is because major companies are starting to invest in it. Right? They're, they're obviously investing in it for their own sake. They're building their own products and improving them. But they're also starting to release them as APIs to the public. And they're bringing the costs like, to near zero. Right? And Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, and Google, they all have their own clap, which is really their draw. Right? They're not just releasing this. To you. There are a lot of companies who you can pay a lot of money who will do these service for you. But for these companies, they realize if they get you hooked on this service, you'll use their ecosystem, like Azure, Bluemix, uh, AWS. And all of a sudden, the plot twists. Because we're at this point, and I'm sorry, this is loosely translated, means God for machine. And the idea is that it's a literary device authors use when they write themselves into a corner and they need to magically solve a problem. But today, it's so interesting because it kind of seems like all these machines are magically solving all these difficult problems. Natural language processing, analytic analysis, text translation, speech to text, or text to speech. And you know, I'm not using it the way that I would. I'm trying to indicate that we're at this point where we have all this technology, all this power, and it's allowing us to do these things that we couldn't have dreamed about even three years ago. And so let's say this really is a, a, a thing that you do try to get into it. There's a lot to understand. Right? So there's your whole level of information that you need to try to get your head around. The concept of models, classification, regression, hidden layers, neural networks, all that. For me, though, and it took me a while to really kind of get my head around it, what helped me try to understand it was a, con a conceptual level. Was I, I thought of it as something that we all probably already understand, which is a search. So in a search, you have a large body of text, and you have a crawler that goes through it, and it processes it into an index. You can use a query and reach into that index and search that body of knowledge. You don't have to have read all of that, but you can find what you're looking for. And machine learning is the same way. So you take this massive body of images or video or medical data or analytics, you process it down into this model, and then you can query that model. And you can get insight into that body of knowledge. And that's what's so powerful about machine learning. And This is what I really want to show you. This is why I came all the way out here, because as I was working on this and I'm you know, reading as much as I can, what I discovered was that there is so much going on that you really need to see this to believe it. Because everything I said now, up till now is really, OK, that's interesting, great. But once you see what's going on, I think you'll have a completely different attitude about approaching it and why you should. So this ring here, uh, each node in this ring, 
indicates a core competency that these companies are providing. Uh, and I'm sorry about the, the size of the text. I'm going to read them uh, clockwise. Starting from the top, uh, there's language, uh, vision, speech, social. You can create your own custom models, analytics, search, and knowledge. Now, each company covers them differently. Uh, so I'm going to go through that and, and show you how that is. Actually, so to, to give you a little explanation to you, because it wasn't clear to, to me at the beginning, but the difference between language and knowledge is the difference between parsing a sentence and trying to understand an entire body of content. And speech is like speech to text or translating between language. So we look at Amazon. Now, Amazon has a, a handful of uh, competencies. I think mostly what they're trying to do is provide custom models, right? They're, they have AWS, they're trying to get you to use that. And what they're expecting is that you're going to bring your own models, bring your own data, and they want you to scale it out in their systems. They provide a couple of extra things, you know, demonstrate it, but they, you know, they, they have more of a, a, probably a smaller set. Now Google, they have a little bit bigger. Uh, again, I think they're really trying to get you into their cloud. They're expecting a lot of like scientists, and then data scientists build their models, training it. Um, they actually got, they made the news with the speech uh, translation. So you can type in some text and it'll translate it to about a dozen different languages and read it to you. And it's like pretty clear. And it's, <laughs> it was fun playing with that one for a good day. IBM is subtly different, right? And as this is the one that I, I'm going to show you a demonstration of today. But this one really I enjoy because it provides the models for you. You're supposed to bring the data and train it. So it gets you like halfway there, but it kind of gives you a lot of flexibility. And that's what is so interesting about it. Plus, they cover quite a few areas. And Microsoft, uh, they have the, the largest set that I've found. Uh, I'm not saying I have found them all, but of the ones that I've researched, they definitely have the most complete set. And what was interesting about them is that they have trained, they built the model, and they trained it. So for if you're trying to get started, theirs is probably the easiest to use, because you simply just hit the API and you get something back like that. Now there are smaller companies obviously investing. There's actually a lot of them and I didn't put them all on here. Uh, that would take <laughs> more time than they would want me up here. But the first company is is Lexalytix. And the reason I found them was because the next problem that I'm going to try to tackle is analytics. I was trying to, you know, start a little easier with some of the other stuff, but analytics is a tough nut to crack. Uh, they have interesting models, uh, a lot of different stuff that I think I can use. Uh, but they're, they've between that and custom models, that's really their specialty. The other one is Rapid Miner. So Rapid Miner is, I think it really started as a tool to do machine learning on your data set. But they provide hosting and analytics are obviously their forte. Uh, I'm sorry if this is difficult to read. It's Nexosis, N-E-X-O-S-I-S. -S. They specialize again, it's the same. I, was, I found them researching analytics and they provide a bunch of custom models. And the last one is Open Calibre. And what they do is a very limited set, but what they do is they'll tag your content. So they have a taxonomy that they have, and they'll you know, you send them your text, and they'll say, okay, that's, this is what that is, or it's what it's related to. So now that you've seen that, right, take, take a minute and think about that. There's a number of different companies, some big, some large, all investing in all these competencies. And now look at this, because this, is the web of intelligence. And what I want you to do is I want you to ask yourself, if you go home today, and you're at your desk, a coworker comes up to you and they ask you, hey, this machine learning thing, is that worth investing in right now? Is that something we should be using or trying to look at? And what I want you to do is, after having seen this, I want you to just ask yourself, is this, is this now something I think that is really worth investing in? Because there are so many things going on, so many companies providing this. So let's assume you're, you're in, right? I'm, I'm in. How do we take Turing's legacy and fulfill that dream of trying to, attempting to build a machine that could resemble some level of intelligence? And I think what we need to do is we stop and realize that we have the building blocks, and they may be rudimentary building blocks, but we have the building blocks now. 
to do this, at least start trying. And what we need to do is like earlier generations, is ask ourselves, how do we think? How does our mind work? Now, I spent the last year trying to uh, get through this and understand it. I've been working with Microsoft's APIs. This year I started working with IBM's. And what I've been building is what I'm calling the cognitive core. And what this is, is on the kind of bottom rung, well, what I'm doing is I'm implementing the APIs. So there's projects that don't know anything about SQL. All they do is connect to the APIs, pass data back and forth. And what I'm trying to do above that is create a layer that makes it level. So you, as developers, can go get this. It's open source. I'll put a link to it later. You can get this. And you can just think about everything above that. I built plumbing. What I want you to think about is how do we build these amazing features? Because that's really how we kind of get to that next level. <laughs> Speaking of killer features, it's demo time. Sir? So where I work at Valir, we have a lot of clients that generate a lot of content, a lot, a lot of content. And one of the problems that they face is that every little thing that they need to do over that amount of articles or content or whatever, it actually takes quite a bit of time. So anytime we can shave off a little bit of their work, it makes it so much easier for them to do things. So one of the problems that I'm trying to solve for them right now is if you have a lot of articles, a lot of things that they need to do is tag them with a taxonomy. So what I'm trying to find a way is instead of having them have to drill through the tree or do search or whatever, they're going to take their content, push a button, it's going to send it off to IBM, and IBM is going to suggest tags for them. And they can just say, yep, 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 done. Like that. Now, the, the, the reason this is incredibly valuable to them, obviously, is because it saves them time. But, you know, once you start having three, four levels of taxonomy, it really starts to, to, to weigh on them how much work is involved in trying to just push one page out the door. Uh, so the, the way I want to kind of explain this is I'm going to demonstrate, like, how the process of how I'm going to hopefully uh, teach users, regular content authors, how they would use machine learning and to benefit themselves. So what I've done here is I've added a tab at the top called Cognitive Tab. Uh, and I have these three buttons, which kind of run this tagging portion. And the first thing you do is you learn a type. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, if I'm going to send this to IBM, I need to be able to, for any given page template, know where the tags are and where the content is. So you're going to build like maps of how these pages can be, can be queried. So I'm going to say, this is my tags field. This is my content field. I can put multiple for, you know, if I want to join them together. And I learn this type. And all it's doing is it's saving this to an item somewhere in the settings. I'll show you that later. But now that I've learned that type, I can use that to push it out to Watson. And when I want to push that data out, this is really something you only have to do kind of like at a setup point where it's, it's done and it's kind of, you don't really have to think about it anymore. Unless, of course, you change your taxonomy, then you will. But if I want to analyze content, right, so what I'm going to do is, let's say I have three taxonomies on my page, or this type of page, or there's sports, there's geographic, or whatever. I'm going to create a different uh, analyzer for it. So I'm going to name it, uh, just test. Again, it, it supports several languages. There are uh, a, a few. Anyway, I'm going to select English. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the articles. I'm going to select Analyze Content. What it's going to do, it's going to do a content search on that template that I selected in the checkbox. And it's going to gather that up. Each page is going to say, I know how to grab the content. I know how to grab the tags. I'm going to build a large array. I'm going to take that and I'm going to send it off to Watson. Watson's going to begin training a model that's already been predefined. And once it's done training, then I can query it. I can say, okay, I'm on a new page. 
I'm going to tag this page. Now, I didn't, uh, I think Wi Fi is slow, so, uh, so I'm just going to cancel this out, but it does work. <laughs> or not a bit. So I'm going to keep talking while that goes. Uh, but the, the idea is that now that we've analyzed it, right, I can, I can then go to this page or any of these pages and drill down to an article. Obviously, I've pre selected these. These are uh, real content items that were generated. There's 30,000 of them. And just for the sake of, you know, being a good uh, host, I'm not going to I, I scrub the names or anything so that it's not obvious who it is. But what I'm demonstrating here is that this item is tagged. And the tags here are in this list. <clears throat> now, if I hit this tag button, and get a model. What it's going to do is it's going to pull the content from those fields that I've, I've told it about, and it's going to join together. And if you read it, you really can't read it. What I've done is I've pulled out what's known as stop words. Now, stop words is a list of words like or, and, is, are, you know, they're things that don't really have relevance to the content, so that all that's left is really the rich keywords of that text. And I, I put a little character limit here, so I know if I'm over, it's basically going to trim the rest and just send it. Um, but I have a list of these um, analyzers, and what I've done is I've, to demonstrate, you know, how the accuracy improves as you give it more information. So what I've did is I've created an analyzer with 100 articles. So if I tag this with that analyzer, it's going to take a while, I guess. Uh, it, it really is not very uh, slow on a very quick uh, internet speed. But what you're going to see is that the Tags that you're going to get back, because I didn't train it with much data, aren't necessarily going to have enough relevance to this article. Right? It doesn't have enough information to draw the inferences between the words and the tags. So if I tag it again and I try it with a little bit larger, uh, I'm just going to skip because it is taking a little longer than I thought. I'm going to, I trained an analyzer with 10,000 articles out of 30,000, so about a third. Uh, when it comes back, you're going to find that the tags are actually starting to become a lot more accurate. And this is where you need to start to understand, is that there is a level of information that you need to provide to the machine learning algorithms so that they have the ability to really understand the text. Now, if you look at the, the tags here in the, on the right, they might, they're out of order a little bit, and it's giving you a percentage of confidence for these. Uh, but I've got orthopedics, dermatology, it's 100% hit there. Uh, you know, there's a few of the articles, like I said, it's, it's moving a little slow, so I'm just going to jump to the last one. The, they all really, they are starting to get pretty accurate. On the, on the whole of the dozens that I've tested, which is not <laughs> an accurate sample set, um, I'd say about two-thirds of the time it's pretty much like head-on. The other third of the time, it's, it gives me extra tags, but it's accurate, and then so the rest of the time, it's just like way off. So there's still, it's a prototype. I'm still learning how to like figure this out. I really only had it working for about two weeks. So it's kind of an interesting, you know, experiment. That was kind of quick. But here, like I said, there are times where you just get things that, you know, five pharma, it is on there. Uh, pharmaceuticals, yeah. Pricing, but there's, okay, so you're looking at this list. You know, like, where did all these words come from? Why is it tagging like that? The person who tagged this article didn't tag that that way. But if you actually go back and you look at the text, so here you see Paraguay, Venezuela, Honduras, all these other things. If I go back to the tagging, if you look in here, it actually does have them. So part of me is like, am I not building an accurate model with the data? Or is it the fact that the people who tag this content, maybe they didn't do it correctly in the first place? So again, there's a bit of, of learning there still to do. But that's the essence of content tagging. And this is something that used to take quite a bit of time, drilling through the tree, trying to find the right one, saving it. Now the machine will just recommend it. And it's not something you can do on, like I would never take a client that has no content, a new website, and say, okay, you're never gonna have to tag content. It's just not possible. But I can do it to many of our clients who have half a million articles and say, look, you've done a great job tagging. You don't have to do that anymore. We're going to make your life a lot easier. And that's the, that's the value proposition that I'm offering with this. Okay, so 
I'm going to show you the system side so you kind of see a little bit more under the under the hood. And content tagging. So under the modules, I'm starting to build this list of, of modules. The analysis here, this is where this is being stored. And it's saying, you know, saving the tags field, uh, the list of content fields, and the template that uh, it relates to. And then the classifiers themselves, which I believe I can show you here if this is refreshing. So this is my list of models in Watson. Uh, and when I sent that data, this is the the new model that's busy training right now. So I'm gonna cancel this because I don't care, really. But if you send it 100 articles, what I found is that it takes about 10 minutes to train. If I send it 10,000, it takes more like an hour and a half. It's still a little bit of time, but in all honesty, it's not something you do very often, so the time really doesn't seem to, to be that much of a, a deterrent. So the classifiers themselves, so I save them here, and this, keeps, this is the most important part, is the classifier ID. That's how you make the, the connection back and forth. The name that I saved, the language that I picked, and the date of the creation, and the, art, the, the page types that I wanted to use for this, so that at some point later I could retrain it, I could requery it, and do the whole thing without much, real, without much effort. So that's it. That's content tagging. That's machine learning built into the UI, made almost step by step, very easy. Hopefully, you're starting to see that this is really something that we can do. This isn't some far off, nebulous, <laughs> crazy technology. This is something that's really very practical. So there's a few other things. Uh, I don't necessarily know how many people saw what I presented last year, but I wanted to show you just so that you see it because it was interesting. And that's not me just telling you what other people told me to. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I did was uh, a Let's see here, I'm gonna jump into the, the image text field. Where is that one? Okay, this is gonna be a great demo. So the I'm just gonna quick edit this template because what I what I did was I created what is an image search. And to, to kind of dive into what it, that means is if you're if you have a massive body of images and you need to, you know, I'm talking tens of thousands. Your foldering isn't really going to help you. You're, you're spending so much time just drilling through files and folders, trying to find that one image that you're looking for. What I did was I said, okay, I've got this analyzer I can send all my images to, and it'll tell me what's in it. And it's all text. So I take that text, I put it in an index, all these computed fields, I pull out all the, the information so that I can pass it on it. And all of a sudden, this massive body of images that you could no longer, that you just can't manage at that size you can suddenly find it almost exactly what you're looking for. Uh, let me... So what I did is I added a button, I added a field, a custom field. I also added a button into the rich text uh, to make it a little easier to, to access. And this here is the image search. So, can't drag. Okay, so what you're seeing here is all these images that I've uploaded, um, stuff that's come with Launch Cycle or other things, all paged. And if you use the slide out, I can filter by color. And it's added, so if I select more than one, it uh, keeps adding <laughs> images from Vegas. Uh, I can also select by size, uh, gender. If I want pictures with just men, I can do that. If I want them with just women, I can also filter by age, which don't get offended, but it's not always accurate, right? Uh, <laughs> I've learned a lot through giving demos of people, pictures, pictures of people I know. Uh, I don't recommend doing that, unless you don't like them. Uh, but, <laughs> What's really cool is it just became this kind of like thing that just started with a small idea and it grew into this thing and now I'm actually, I've got one client who's like, wow, that's really awesome, We're, we'll take it. So I'm just about ready to actually push this out into production. Uh, again, sorry if I'm rushing through this. Uh, being on stage has that tendency of, with me. But the second thing that I did was I, I built a chatbot called Ola. Some of you may actually know the person that's named after but you can ask it things. 
Uh, one of the things I think that just kind of annoys me is I was trying to drill for the file that has the version in it. So I, first thing I did was build something that could just tell me what the version is. So I get into a, a system and just know. Uh, I can ask them to do more complicated things like uh, And it'll ask you for all the parameters that you, you need to provide. Uh, yeah, and, and I can actually touch it. My screen is touch screen. So imagine if you were on a phone, because this, there's actually a button in the launch pad. You're on a phone, you're on a train, maybe you're stuck in traffic. You can still make uh, productivity. You, you can get things done by having this new other interface. So being able to do something complicated, right? Not everybody is impressed with the chatbot, as I've come to find. Um, but it wasn't something I knew I was late for the game. It's not something new. Uh, what I was trying to do was just demonstrate that you can parse people's language. You can make it do things that are useful in a kind of simple, click-through way. It's just another idea. And I, I'm going to explain a little bit more of that idea after the demo. but. What I hope to show you is that these tools are really quite practical. We can build all kinds of interesting features, image searches, chatbots, content tagging. All we need to do is just start to really take the time and soak in what it is that's going on. OK, so that kind of uh, finishes the demo portion of that. You want to swing back? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Everybody's like, oh, don't make German jokes. I'm like, come on. Come on. <laughs> Um, so what you saw, and I'm just going to walk over through it again because I want you to kind of soak it through so it's not terribly confusing, is what the first thing I did was I was learning this type, right? So back to the, the content type. I'm learning a type so that I understand how to pull content from it. Uh, then I'm processing that. I'm, I'm doing a search. I'm getting the, the correct types, pulling it all together, building an array. I send it to Watson. Watson trains on it. And then once it's done, I'm free to tag as much content as I want. And it's not all that complicated. I mean, it did take me, I mean, really, I mean for as much, you know, work as I put in, it probably wasn't the most work I've ever really put in on something. The image search definitely took me like 10 times longer. So it's not that complicated. Don't be afraid. You know, got to get used to the idea that this is now going to be a thing. Now, if you want to get your hands on it, obviously, I have it on GitHub, and uh, the URL is here. Feel free to download it. If you're going to get the source, you have to obviously be a little bit more developer centric, confident in that area. Uh, if that's not your thing, though, and you want to just get the modules, so the chatbot and the, uh, the image search on modules, I haven't done them up on the on Marketplace yet, but if you go to my website, uh, find the Cognitive Services Modules page, blog post, uh, the links are there, and a bit of a description of you know, what you're going to expect when you work with them. So like I was talking about all the chat, right? Chatbots, okay. You can tell it to do something, it can do it for you. Sure, that's, that's minimally impressive. But what you need to start to do is start to think larger, right? What if I would take Ola and have it always running on an agent? Checking the system. Seeing what could be optimized, and then reaching back to you, an admin, and starting to tell you the health of the system. Now it's more of a two-way conversation. You're starting to actually build a nascent relationship with your system. And it can start to tell you things like, hey, did you know that your system is underperforming? I've noticed that you haven't created any goals, any rules, or campaigns. Would you like to? Maybe, maybe even in the far off distance, you can start to have it analyzed in your analytics, figuring out what content is really working for different demographics and teaching you how to write good content. Now, all of a sudden, all these things that were wearing you down and making your life difficult, they're not anymore. Your job is much easier. You're starting to get much more effective. And you come to this place you start to realize you're getting a lot more done. And what I'm hoping is that we're going to see Sitecore become what I'm terming 
an energy efficient marketing platform. You're going to go in and have maybe like a little conversation. It's going to tell you what's going on. There's some log errors. Maybe you should look into it. Maybe you should check out and set your caching, improve some of the page performance. Self optimizing site <coughs> system. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Now this is not to be confused with uh, German efficiency, different thing, all together. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm going to leave you with this, and that should not be yelled at the public and distracted. Um, when you go home, and you get back to your desks, and you're starting to think about this, and, and you potentially want to dive in, what I'm going to say is remember Turing. See his vision. Build intelligent and market smarter. Did I mention I work at Blue? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.